Yes, we've had about 40 amazing people that have come together to work on this conference, and I was hoping folks could stand up and just wave your hand so we could appreciate all that, because people have been meeting very intensely.
We also know we don't have the power or the political will right now to get us to where we need. And so our workshop is going to be, um, in the spirit of open space, really allowing people to come and um, figure out where we are and where the Pioneer Valley is in relation to the greater movement. Uh, we're going to tell you about what is happening uh, in Massachusetts, New England, and nationally, how you can plug in and um, explore whether you want to maybe create a more explicit Pioneer Valley 315 network to develop leaders and build a movement that can really have a huge impact on the rest of um, what's happening. Hi everyone, I'm really glad to be here. My name is Kim, I live in East Hampton, and I'm a volunteer with the Sierra Club Beyond the Coal Campaign. And I don't know how many of you know this, but there is actually a coal burning plant in Holyoke. And in addition, in addition to putting out um, more carbon pollution than any other type of fossil fuel, this coal plant also produces tons of other toxic air pollution, including things like sulfur dioxide. And it's making people in our valley really sick. Um, the asthma rate in Holyoke is twice the state average, and uh, we think this is unacceptable. So our campaign focuses on putting pressure on Governor Patrick to shut down the coal plant and to make Massachusetts coal free. And uh, we are working with some great partners in Holyoke, uh, Action for a Healthy Holyoke, uh, uh, Neighbor to Neighbor, and Nuestros Traces, who are also here today. Mm -hmm. solar movement, what we've discerned is the need for a campaign for community solar that will boost the relatively unused uh, method of getting groups of people together to put up a raise, especially like if you don't have room on your roof, you don't have a big enough lot, or you don't own property. You want to get together with other people to put together solar arrays and move us from the centrally generated paradigm in electricity to a distributed generation model. I'm Michael Ann Busey with the Rise for Social Justice in Springfield. Uh, two minutes. Uh, fortunately, I'm saved from trying to think too hard about how to talk about climate change and poor people by running into a paragraph I wrote to my group about two and a half years ago. I have thought for some time that the climate change movement, at least as I have experienced it, is failing to see the forest for the trees. Environmental justice is not a subset of preventing or mitigating climate change. It's the other way around. Environmental justice is the overarching principle. Unless we can find concrete ways to help people understand that environmental justice is their human right and connect the issue of climate change to people's lives, There'll never be a sufficient mass of people demanding policy change. Um, if we want our Western Mass community to be engaged for the long haul, to fight the next battle and win the war, then it's our responsibility as activists and organizers to help our community claim our right to live in a fair and sustainable world. <laughs> change in militarism workshop, which will be right over there. Many of us approach war from how many people it kills, how much money it takes from our economy that could go to schools, to roads, to bridges, to health care, all the things that we need. But then there are many others of us who approach war as well from the environmental damage that it inflicts not just with the bombs that it drops on the people of foreign lands, but also the climate change that it is wreaking. We drive our Priuses, we go, um, we carpool, we walk, we hang our clothes on the line, we do all the things that we need to do in our personal lives to try to prevent climate change. But at the same time, when an F-16 goes over, spilling tons and tons and tons of carbon and other more noxious greenhouse gases in, into the atmosphere, 
We, all of our efforts are blotted out. Come join me, let's figure out what to do right over there, two o'clock. Hi, I'm Pat Hines from the Trap Rock Center for Peace and Justice and Nuclear Free Future. Our workshop is Why Nuclear Power is Not the Answer to Climate Change. Some climate scientists and climate change activists have singled out fossil fuels as the sole target of action to slow global warming and climate change. Further, they are either silent on nuclear power or they maintain that it is necessary to replace fossil fuels. Thus, nuclear power is baptized as clean energy because it is allegedly, it does not generate the global warming gas carbon dioxide. Nuclear power is, in fact, a wolf in zero carbon clothing. It is not a solution to climate change for six interrelated reasons. It's intensive water use. It's increasing production losses and shutdowns from record-breaking heat and flood, drought and flooding. It's severe thermal pollution of aquatic ecosystems. The threat of drought-induced wildfires spreading radioactive contamination. It's substantial CO2 emissions from uranium mining, milling, fuel processing, plant decommissioning, and long-term storage of, of, of wasted fuel. Finally, it's failed economics and growing rejection by even the nuclear industry as well as Wall Street and many countries, including the world's third and fourth largest economies, Japan and Germany. In this workshop, we will lay out the web of connections between nuclear power and climate change using very recent examples, 2010, 2011. And we will provide alternate scenarios developed by experts for an energy efficient world powered by wind, water, and rain. Our workshop will feature three activist groups, Nuclear Free Future, the Shutting Down Affinity Group, and Sage Alliance. Together they have more than 12 years combined of creative activism, activism which comes from the heart. Join us in room 13 to brainstorm. I'm retired EMS chemistry professor. I spent 62 years in Amherst, a very enjoyable time, and I'd like to see my children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren who are living here have as good a time. Now we've heard some of the bad things about burning coal and oil and natural gas. They're producing carbon dioxide. Where's the energy coming from? It comes from the sun, and it comes from the fact that these plants have uh, absorbed carbon dioxide by photosynthesis, and then these plants have been converted into these fossil fuels by geological action over billions of years and we're getting this energy back by burning the products in just a few years. This is not sustainable, it can't go on. So I'm representing the Pioneer Valley Biochar Initiative, which works with the New England Small Farm Institute in Belchertown, and Ted Waisaki here is one of my associates, and also the Center of Agriculture at UMass. Biochar is a form of carbon where we convert the plant material into this, relatively simply using a method that was advanced by the natives in the, of the Amazon as described by the Amherst author Charles Mann in his best-selling book 1491. And one can take this material and put it in the ground, it's a form of carbon, and it stays there for centuries. So I call this coal mining in reverse. We're taking carbon dioxide out of the air and putting the carbon back in the ground. Also, this is an aid to agriculture and it can increase plant growth by as much as a factor of two or three. It can convert infertile soils into fertile ones. The Arabs are growing things in the desert using it. And uh, it also conserves water. And the shortage of water and food and so on, in addition to air contamination, is a big problem. Really, with the Pioneer Valley Relocalization Project, we've been writing a column of the Emirates Bulletin that goes out to the seven towns on the side of the river for the past two and a half years on, on the various facets of relocalization. Relocalization is trying to imagine how we can live in a town that's much more human scale. And um, the, 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 the central concept is to build up and not out. We want to rain and sprawl. So the, the two problems we have all across America is uh, the automobile create and the mall creating sprawl. And that makes longer distances to commute to our workplaces. So the idea is we want to, to what we're mainly working on here is mass transportation, carpooling, 
just different kinds of buses and minivans that would serve, say, Greater Amherst. And if we had these minivans and carpool essentially overnight, this would uh, uh, rapidly change the tenor of the town and we would be modeling a whole different way of living. I'm, uh, I'm here about fracking. I've been tracking fracking for about nine years and nine to ten years. Most people who ask me something about fracking pretty much wish they'd never asked me because <laughs> they get a near -hole. I'm originally from Texas. I grew up in Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, which is the hub of where fracking really started. I knew oil and gas people. Um, my daughter's uh, father was an oil man. Um, when, it, when it first started, um, when fracking first started, there wasn't a whole lot of information about it. It was very hidden, kind of done in the backwoods. Um, and then 2005 was a game changer. 2005, Bush got Congress to pass that, that the fracking oil and gas companies do not have to follow or, nor adhere to the EPA's water and air uh, environmental laws. Mm -hmm. To this day, in 2009, uh, after, after in 2009, they did. There has been some bills presented to make them accountable, and today they've never ever passed. In fracking, there's they use approximately 3.5 million gallons of clean water per well, with approximately 80,000 pounds of chemicals that they do not have to tell anybody what they're using. Now, as a result, you, the United States is the largest producer of nat natural gas in the world. Um, not only has there been water contamination, um, it, they suspect within 20 to 30 years that this is not stemmed. I'm sorry. So, I'm Adi, and we're going to talk about fracking and how natural gas is a big part of the energy mix in Massachusetts, so we don't have fracking in Massachusetts but we're depending on a lot of gas and we need to change that around, so come talk to us about some pipeline expansion okay. is proposed. Outside. This is Karen, and um, we're here today to um, talk to you and record interviews with you about um, your personal experiences of climate change. When you first heard about global warming as a phenomenon, when you first experienced it or thought you might be experiencing it, so your personal stories, um, if you're interested, you can come and talk to us. We're going to be in the hall right out there. So we're going to be doing this in 15 minute slots, and we have two stations, and you can do this while also doing a workshop. So you can sign up and know when you'll come out, leave your workshop, and then go back in, and you'll see us out there. We're going to be making a podcast out of this, and if you have ideas for radio shows or websites where we can share this, um, it's going to be a great way to share the voices of people here. That's it. You're ready to come up and tell us about your action stuff. John. Hi, I represent Transition Amherst. We're a group in town. Uh, we're having an event on the 13th of next month. We'd like you all to come in the middle school. Can everybody hear me? Thank you. 
volunteer transition amherst.org we have a lot of information there thank you corporate accountability and divestment we had a lot of people there we had a lot of good discussion there was a focus on college organizing getting in touch with all the five colleges organizing some kind of communication between them and feeling reinforced by 350.org and all the work that's going on in Boston. Some dynamic work there. We had a strategy session. There was going to be a listserv of all the people that was, were part of that or all the people that want to get the information back on that. There will be a follow-up meeting and people to send to Dan Grubbs, uh, Verizon.com, I guess it is. Dot net. We'll get the information that will tell them how to get there. There's an economic and moral issues group focusing on investment and how do we speed this process up. The sense is we need a broad base. Let's get all the organizations we know of participating in this. Then there was some focus on TIAA prep. How do I get the people that invest for me out of ExxonMobil and other things? Uh, war in the environment a depressing topic, but we have ideas. Um, ways to take action. Be aware there are local ballot initiatives already out there. Our, the Fund Our Communities movement, bring those four dollars home. Be aware of those and talk them up. Um, we need to get the peace activists and the climate change activists working together and looking at redefining our security what security is. Raise awareness about uh, planetary destruction and that, it's, uh, of the, that the military does and that it's not just the lives immediately, immediately lost, but a lot of really bad stuff is going into the environment from the military. More than you ever could imagine. Read Barry Sanders' book, try Alice and Lincoln Day's DVD. Uh, for sources of that. Focus on the air shows. The thought was, hey, these air shows, um, apparently an F-15 takes part in 75 of them. Focus on those. Reach out to youth. We tended to be a little gray-haired in our group. Um, politically, be aware that Romney wants to increase the military budget. Day-to-day no. uh, -day talk with people about these issues, such as that and others. On October 4th to 6th, there's a conference at Tufts on the war, connecting the war and the environment. We're going to have to... Uh, I'm backing up here, but there's a meeting coming up on the 20th of September, and people will get an email about that. Divest from military contracts. That's our divest... That's our divestor idea. <laughs> so, um... Climate Change Radio interviewed a ton of people, and we're going to be pulling that together for a podcast, um, really highlighting very um, a lot of feelings and stories around climate change and activism. And um, we're going to let everyone know who signed your release form when we're finished with that and where we'll post it, and we're going to continue to be interested in ideas of where to distribute that. Okay, and we'll actually send out an email to everyone who's attended today. We're really excited to share this. Thanks. Folks are in the area. We've given samples to several local farms who are trying to use it. We're working with the New England's Moore Farm Institute in Belchertown, who have gotten the Department of Agriculture grant for a device to make it. It's a mobile device that could be moved from one farm to another. Uh, Ted Waisaki is here, and I gave a workshop at the New England Association of Chemistry Teachers at Bridgewater State College last month, and we're now preparing an article based upon our presentation. We're very pleased that we've been designated by the U.S. Biochar Initiative to be the location of the national conference on this next year. So we're going to be having a North American Biochar Symposium in Amherst, October 13th through 15th, 2013. So our focus of our efforts is to prepare this, get support for it, and uh, we're looking forward to that event. The Hyper Valley Relocalization Project, <clears throat> we spoke with several people about the very tough problem of getting people out of single passenger car use. And the town manager in Amherst is very much behind doing this, and we've been lobbying him for about a year on this or more. 
And uh, there's a sort of a one-year window here to work with him and get something really radical done and in a hurry. And we'll be meeting on Monday, uh, September 24th at a house in South Amherst for a general discussion. And um, to uh, contact me about this, uh, email me at pvrelocal at gmail.com pvrelocal at gmail.com and this will be a gathering of maybe 10 to 20 people uh, with uh, supper at 6 o'clock and uh, just talking over various issues and p uh, problems people have um, by, uh, you know, hesitancy they have in keeping with single passenger cars and not going to various kinds of mass transit vans, buses, or a car closed system, say, administered by Hubtown Amherst. At the Arise workshop, which they were both small, but they were consisted of people who are absolutely convinced that you can't have a successful climate change movement without poor people in the working class. Um, we, I, I would say that the biggest thing we talked about was two biggest things, connecting resources from a very well utilized um, communities in Amherst and Northampton with the less um, underfunded resources in Springfield. And the second thing is to have a Springfield Climate Change Conference um, that can connect and please steal this line. Every environmental issue is a public health issue in disguise. Every environmental issue is a public health issue in disguise. And if we can have a climate change conference in Springfield that pu puts people's well-being and ability to stay alive in the context of climate change, then I think we'll have something. There will be a list serve. Thanks. The nuclear power is not the answer to climate change panel. Um, and we discussed uh, largely what, um, what different activist groups in the area have been doing uh, over the past year and, and longer in many cases. Uh, I think the framework of it was a lot about, uh, somebody had, had actually um, said that a lot of the leaders in the climate change movement, uh, such as Bill McKibben and James Hansen, um, have this sort of tunnel vision, which is that they're concerned with the atmosphere, but not necessarily so much concerned with other damage to the biosphere, um, like the things that would, uh, that would happen uh, from the failure of nuclear plants. Um, the actions that we came up with were things like letters to the editor, um, we talked about private and government programs for solarizing um, your, your homes and, and communities, uh, and then uh, most notably there's a flotilla at Vernon next week uh, near the Vermont Yankee plant, uh, and you can find out about that at the Safe and Green website, and the Nuclear Free Future Coalition um, in, the, in the fall will be putting on a solarizing Northampton event. Thanks. We're going to have a fabulous sing-along in about two minutes. There's just a couple of things I wanted to say when we're all here. One of them is that Mary has some baskets. Mary, can you wave your arm? We do want to collect some money for the church and for, if you can get a little money for today, that would be fabulous. If people can help with chairs, if you can just meet in the back of the sanctuary at the end, we would love that. And very importantly, we really want to stay connected. We see this as a first step, as we've said. So our website is climateactionnowmass.org, and it's up there. Uh, MA, I'm sorry, no S is on that. climateactionnowma.org. And everybody who summed up a workshop, if you could email me, see me if um, you don't know my email. We want to get summaries up on the website of all the workshops. If anyone didn't sign up to be on our email list, it won't be a lot of email to the big list, but there's folks who have um, clipboards, so if you didn't sign up, please do before you leave. And we are meeting here tomorrow night at 7.15. We want to build on the energy. We don't want to waste any time. We don't have any time to waste. So if you can join us tomorrow night, we're right across the hall at 7.15. And I'm going to turn it over to Margaret and then to our sauce.
Uh, in case you don't know, Lyle's bookstore is open Tuesday to Saturday, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. If you'd like to buy a, a signed book by Bill McGibbon. We are saving no So what do you think, Susan? You were one of the organizers of this. The, the first day is over. So uh, how was this? This was really exciting. People showed up. There were fabulous workshops. It, it, the energy was great. I mean, it's very exciting. It's a first step, and we have a lot of work to do. But I'm really, I'm really happy. People really showed up, and they stayed. And they I mean, stayed. They stayed. So, so then we asked Marty, the, another one of the major organizers. So what? How was this, Marty? This was wonderful. I mean, it really shows the power of people. Um, we have the capacity to do great harm. We have the capacity to do great good. What we gathered here to do today was to begin to do great good. And I'm glad to have shared the day with Paki Whelan.